So uh, to continue with our asymptotic notation, um, we're going to actually analyze a couple simple algorithms here. So here we've got a, uh, an algorithm which loops through some uh, loops through some array and returns the largest value in the array, right? So we set some we set some variable here, temp, to be the first value in the array, and we loop through the rest of the arrays until we return the largest array. What we want to do is we want to analyze the runtime for this algorithm. Okay, so great, we're going to set up some runtime, and this loop, you know, we're going to go through this loop for i equals two, three, four, up to n. We're going to bound our runtime by some summation over the iterations of the loop. Now, you see the summation goes from 1 instead of 2, like my actual loop does. That's okay. All the terms I'm going to have there are going to be positive. I'm just trying to get an upper bound here, all right? And within the loop, I have some number of operations. I don't know exactly how many. I'm going to call it 3. You know, there's an if conditional. Maybe there's an assignment. Maybe you have to increment i. So we have, you know, for each iteration through the loop, maybe we have something like 3 operations, okay? In addition to those three operations per iteration, the algorithm has some other operations like, you know, maybe allocate space for temp, make an assignment for temp to A1, um, return temps. I'll call it five. I'll say, look, you've got five other operations that aren't per iteration. And this gives an upper bound on how many operations uh, this algorithm has, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to say, look, well, we can get rid of the summation. Um, just with some you know, summation from 1 to n is n. This gives us the runtime is no more than 3n plus 5, and 3n plus 5 is bounded by 4n as long as n is at least 5. This is where we sort of use our n naught. We use our n naught to not carry about small values of n and uh, or to, to, to knock off the lower order terms of this equation. Right? I can also give a lower bound of t of n. t of n is, well, we have these iterations. Again, we have, well, in this case, I have n minus 1 iterations. Each iteration takes, let's say, at least one operation. I'm going to be a little bit more careful about this lower bound since we're now we're lower bounding t of n's runtime. I say, great, t of n takes at least this long to run. So t of n, when you run t of n, it has at least n minus 1 operations if you run this algorithm. Okay? Well, n1 minus 1 is at least n over 2. It's at least 1 half times n for n value at least equal to 2. All right? So from that, we have, great, t of n is upper bounded by n. It's O of n, big O of n. t of n is also lower bounded. It's big omega of n. So t of n is theta of n. We have a precise asymptotic bound on t of n. Next, we'll look at bubble sort. Bubble sort has a nested loop, so it's a little bit more complex. Um, again, we have this sort of upper bound. Well, in this case, I have uh, an outer loop that goes from i equals 1 up to n, and I've got an inner loop that goes from i plus 1 up to n, and then some number of operations within that inner loop. I don't know how many operations. Oh, there's a conditional, there's a swap, which probably has a few assignments. Maybe there's like five, uh, maybe there's like uh, then we're going to have to increment j. Maybe it's like, I don't know, four or five operations. And then additionally, for each thing in the inner, oper in the inner loop, we have another operation for the outer loop. I'm going to just put that all in the inner loop and say something like, you know, this function's runtime is bounded by six times the number of times you hit the inner loop. Okay? Um, we could try to be more precise, but in the end, it's all going to simplify to something like this. So great. Um, we're going to get rid of that inner summation. This has uh, something like uh, n minus i plus 1 terms. Uh, I'm going to get rid of that inner summation. Some algebra. I'm going to simplify that. Do some more algebra. And in the end, this, this term here equals this thing over here. And clearly, this term is this last this last thing here is no larger than 6n squared because it's 6n squared minus something so we have a bound here we have t of n is no bigger than 6n squared operations and from that we have an upper bound of n squared on bubble sorts performance all right 
Similarly, we have a lower bound on bubble sorts operations. Uh, bubble sort takes at least as many operations as, let's say, iterations over the inner loop. It has so many iterations over the inner loop. We simplify that down, a bunch of algebra. Um, I won't make you sit through that step by step. But in the end, I get something like n squared minus something equal. OK, so I have this many steps. T of n, uh, bubble sort has at least as many operations as n squared minus n divided by 2. Now, n squared minus n over 2 is at least 1 quarter n squared if n is at least 2. Again, that's going to be our n naught. We sort of use it to knock off this lower order term. We get the runtime of bubble sort is big omega of n squared. It's lower bounded by n squared. Well, if it's lower bounded and upper bounded by n squared, we have the runtime of bubble sort is theta n squared. Okay, that's a precise runtime for bubble sort. So for an algorithm, we can look at best case time. That is, you know, I give the algorithm uh, some input, size n. What's the fastest that it can return? I can look at average case if either the algorithm has some random choices of its own or takes different run times depending on what input it's given. I can look at worst case. Uh, what's the worst possible run time that the algorithm can take? Um, Something to note, if we're talking about best case, that doesn't mean I get to assume that n equals 1. I go, you know, I want to sort n numbers. What's the best case? Well, if n equals 1, it takes constant time. No, that, that's, that's not what we mean by best case. We mean for a given n, for, a, for, for an arbitrary n, what's the function which uh, shows the best case runtime of the algorithm for that n, right? Now, best case is pretty optimistic. It's not too helpful. Um, to give a nice example to see where it's not very helpful. Search, let's say I give you an unordered array, and I say, see if you have the number 16 in it, uh, and you look at the very first number, and it happens to be 16, bang, you found it, you can return it. Hey, search is theta 1 best case runtime. That's pretty optimistic, uh, probably not so helpful. Average case is pretty hard to do, and also you need to know over what distribution. Is it over the distribution of your input? What's the... Uh, it's hard to know what the uh, distribution of your input is, right? I mean, you're writing a program, and maybe someone else is calling your program. You, you need to know the distribution of their data. Uh, or perhaps you could have distribution over your own random choices, like our randomized quicksort algorithm. That's going to be a, an average case analysis. Um, the other thing you can do is worst case analysis. Now, that's very pessimistic, but... If I can give you a good worst case bound, it really means something strong. It means no matter what, this isn't going to have such bad performance, right? So far, we've talked about analyzing a couple of specific algorithms, bubble sort and uh, finding the max. You can also analyze sort of problem instead of specific algorithms, analyze problems in general. So I can say, you know what? Let's think about the problem of sorting, okay? Now, we know that insertion sort is a worst case uh, n squared big O. It's insertion sort sorts, and it's a big O of n squared algorithm. So that tells us that sorting, in the worst case, sorting is still a big O of n squared uh, problem, okay? Because there exists a big O n squared algorithm to sort, the problem of sorting is a big O n squared problem. We also know that quick sort is an average case big O n log n problem. So that tells us that on in, with a randomized algorithm, you can sort, you can solve sorting in n log n. It's the average case needed to solve an, ar an arbitrary input of sorting is big O n log n. And finally, well, merge sort is a worst case sorting algorithm big O n log n. So that algorithm shows that the problem of sorting is a big O n log n problem. Okay. Again, uh, if these first and third things sort of look different, it's good to remember that you know, hey, this is saying that the runtime of the best possible algorithm is in this set of things which grow no faster than n squared. Well, it's also in the smaller subset of things which grow no faster than n log n. Now, in part one of this video, 
uh, we sort of mathematically went through a whole bunch of uh, equations to say, look, I have two different functions. How do you show that one is big O of another one? Um, a lot of people don't particularly like working with those equations. Something else that you can do is try to look at pictures, or it's very tempting to look at pictures, but it's also very dangerous. So in this case, I go, look, here's three algorithms, here's three functions. And I want to know, you know, which one grows fastest. And if I just look at the functions for small values, say up to n, it, it looks very clear that uh, the green function grows fastest, then the blue function, and the red function. Even if I go a little bit further, let's say I go up to n equals 10, well, it still looks like the green function grows fastest, the blue function is next, and the red function is the smallest. But of course, even n equals 10 is a really small value. What happens if I go a little higher? Well, if I go up to value 20, n equals 20, we start to see the red function really take off here. And it turns out that going up to 10 just wasn't far enough. If you want to analyze things graphic, the sort of this question, how far do you have to go? What does n not have to be before the graph is going to show you what you need to see? So in this case, the red function is exponential. It's 2 to the n, and it grows much faster than both the uh, 50n cubed green function and the n to the fourth blue function. Okay. By the time we get to 20, you can see that, but if you stopped looking at 10, you just wouldn't know that, okay? Now, when you get to 20, the green function still also looks much bigger than the blue function, but, you know, of course, from the functions themselves, we expect n to the fourth to grow faster than n cubed. Even n to the fourth should grow faster than 50 n cubed, as long as n is big enough. In this case, if n is equal to 50, you'd expect the n one n term to be bigger than or equal to 50, and the other n cubed term is sort of equal, right? So dropping the exponential term, because it just gets way too big, once I go up to say n equals 60, I start to see, oh, now the blue function looks a little bit bigger. They're equal at n equal 50, but this is sort of just an example to show that you can't rely on graphs to prove anything. Maybe you can get an intuition from them, but if somebody you know, gives you nasty enough functions, you don't know how big you need to make n before the graphs mean something. All right, thank you.